Today is Wednesday, September the 18th, 2024. And I did go back and look at the field technology um, discussion of the um, subcommittee for armed services that I posted in advance was upcoming for people who might be interested in watching it. And I am going to share a clip from it. But the reason that I'm going to share a clip from it is so that people who are typically intimidated or even bored by watching these kinds of meetings can give themselves an opportunity to really step into your um, your own knowledge, to give people an opportunity to take full ownership of their own common sense and judgment of character because it's pretty obvious if you aren't caught up in any of the language that they use or the special specialized terms that they use and you just see it what for what it is because the issue with understanding these meetings is probably just as challenging for the salesmen who present as witnesses for it and trying to follow along with exactly what it is that's being asked of them in fact um the uh, ranking chairman uh, who speaks the most in the clips that I'm going to use say he says himself that they present problems that the Department of Defense are actually having real problems that they're having to undergraduate students and ask them how they would solve the problem and the feedback that they get most often from those students is that they weren't presented with the real problem, that there was really something else that the Department of Defense was struggling with. But, um, you know, they were trying to work towards resolving that, but that wasn't the real problem. And the rest of the clip really sort of just speaks to that. More importantly, though, um, the timing is great because following the assassination attempt of Donald Trump, Earlier this week, um, I mentioned in a video that I did yesterday that, you know, my biggest concern was as I listened to social commentary about the assassination um, and even some of the interviews with Secret Service agents, that there's no long term planning for how to prevent this from happening. I mean, there, there's discussion that that's necessary, but it's as if. In order to be able to think about what the long-term solution would be to keep the president safe or any person that's being protected by the Secret Service safe um, can't be explored right now because we have to deal with the more urgent issue of, you know, this election coming up and making sure that with all the rallies and everything that, you know, that they can come up with something that will provide that security. And if you watch the clips or even go back and watch the whole two hour. I, I wasn't interested. I just, I, I watched the first 20 minutes of it and that's all I needed to be able to pull out what I needed to be able to share this with you today. Um, that's how they think. There is no long-term planning. When you have a long-term goal, like um, raising a family to three generations, um, but when you have a lot or graduating for let's let's be more let me be more concrete and say something like um, fit, completing a uh, undergraduate college program, then you can start to task out things that you'll need to accomplish in order to uh, on an ongoing basis, daily, monthly, um, per term, per semester, per year in order to graduate that could then be adjusted for life because things come up and, you know, there may be a delay or there may be an opportunity and can move things faster than you had anticipated. But the goal, the goal doesn't change. The goal stays the same. What changes is the method to get there. Well, they have no long-term goal other than to continue to fight and to try to, you know, preserve the system that is oppressive to everyone, including them. And so as a result of that, you know, there the focus will always be short term. You know, how are we going to get from, you know, um, point A to point B with no uh, clarity or even um, perspective about C, D, E, F, G, element of P, Q, R, S, T, U, V. It's just because they they don't have any long-term purpose and they don't have any long-term goals. And so you can't set 
uh, objectives that will help work towards anything. If your goal is we want to go and fight and kill people and we want to keep war ongoing, then it's really just about what fight can we start? And then based on the fight that we started, who, you know, what do we need to be able to overcome them? And of course, it's not necessarily that they want to go around starting fights. They do. Um, but also sometimes it's because there is a real threat to the system and they have to get in there and try to figure out how they're going to circumvent that. Usually the threat to the system is people waking up and realizing, you know, we don't want this anymore. <laughs> you know, this is, you know, this is, you know, fraudulent and, you know, it's not honest. And mo more importantly, it's very oppressive. And so we, you know, we as a community, we don't want that or as a city, as a country, as a state or whatever, we don't want it. And, you know, we're, we're, we, we're going to stop. And so then they, you know, they have to go in to try to do something because they, they can't, risk other people being awakened by those who have realized that they don't want the system anymore. So I want to share the clip with you and then um, I want to help you to understand how the way that these young men, well, you know, I, I, they're, they're young to me, um, how they are pitching. It's uh, another way to look at this um, hearing is it's like a shark tank. Um, that television show Shark Tank where people have businesses and they go in before a panel of people who have money and they have to sort of present their product in a way that they want to invest in whatever it is they're providing. So, you know, just consider that it's like a shark. It's like the show Shark Tank, but they're talking about weapons to kill people. Or survey of people or police people or, you know, cause harm to people as a deterrent. That's what they're selling. And and that's how they're presenting it. And it, if, if you think of it that way, it may be more interesting for you. And you may be able to follow along um, a lot better, even if you don't understand all of the terms that they're using. You know what the overall intention of the meeting is, is to find people who are not only willing to innovate, products that the Department of Defense can use, but to be able to do it quickly and to be able to do it cheaply. The chairman has outlined, struggled with this for a number of years. We have, primarily under the leadership of uh, Mac Thornberry when he was chair of this committee, given the authority to the Department of Defense to make innovations in a variety of different ways. There's one important caveat to that, which I'll get to at the end of my statement. But that authority is there, and yet we still move too slowly. We are very focused on requirements and process as opposed to being focused on solutions. And an example I've used many times, I met with um, Stanford has a thing called Hacking for Defense, which is at a whole bunch of different universities where they take a group of undergraduates and give them a real world Department of Defense problem, something that DOD is trying to solve, um, and ask them a question, here's what we want. And when I met with the students who went through that process, every single group said the same thing. The first thing we figured out is that they were asking the wrong question, okay, that they were actually focused on solving something else. So we pivoted and we adapted and we solved that problem. But within the DOD world, that adaption and pivot is very slow. I'm going to try not to pause through this um, to provide clarity, but the statement that ranking member Smith just made is really important because what he just said is that they gave the students a problem to solve and they were able to solve it, but because they solved a problem that was not the true issue that the Department of Defense was having, it is the responsibility of the Department of Defense to take the solutions that these kids have come up with to convert it to the use that they actually have for it. Because you couldn't go in there and tell new and fresh students who are not in the military, we want to use this in order to hurt people or to intercept their personal communication or anything like that and have them be invested in actually coming up with a usable solution. And that is what he means when he says the Department of Defense has too long a delay in being able to pivot from the solutions that they come up with and converting it into a malicious use. Okay, that they were actually focused on solving something else. So we pivoted and we adapted and we solved that problem. But within the DOD world, that adaption and pivot is very slow because the requirements, because the process is built in, we'll spend years 
issues, trying to, ask, trying to answer the wrong question, just because that's what was set in motion. We've got to be able to pivot and adapt and move more quickly. And I think a big part of it is culture within DOD. But all of you have experience uh, in working in that. We would love to hear your particular stories about what didn't work and, crucially, how it could work better. Um, we, we have a bunch of changes that need to be made there, and we want to work on that. The, the one caveat, yes, we have given the DOD a great deal of authority, but at the end of the day, we still appropriate. There is the authority for other transactional uh, authority decisions and a whole series of other things where DOD can theoretically make a decision to skip the normal requirements process um, and move more quickly. You'll also hear throughout this presentation discussion of the problems that are created by the requirements. And I want you to keep in mind that it is highly likely that the requirements that they are talking about are put in place as safety precautions or to ensure the welfare of the people who are going to be either using the equipment or will be building and manufacturing the equipment. And it's the same as any other type of um, safety or regulatory process. And so they, they say, and we want this particular product, but here are the requirements. We need it to cover this, 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 and this, which will likely based on how the questions are asked and are being responded to in this in this committee hearing would not allow them to convert its use for a malicious purpose. I hope that makes sense. We make a decision to skip the normal requirements process um, and move more quickly. But Congress lays out they got to have money to do that. And if we appropriate down to the last penny and restrict their ability to move it around, that authority doesn't help them. So one thing, I know this committee, we're, we, we need to work with our friends on the Appropriations Committee to see how we can build in greater flexibility so that the Pentagon can use the authority uh, that we've given them. Uh, but I just want to close by emphasizing how important this is. Um, whoever gets there first on the new technology has an enormous advantage, and that's been true for as long as human civilization has existed and tried to defend itself against their adversaries. And there are all kinds of historical examples of who figured out the machine gun first or the tank first or the nuclear bomb first. Um, now this is happening weekly, if not daily. You know, new technologies are being developed for drones and for counter drones, for secure communications or how to disrupt communications so that your missile loses its signal in mid-flight and can't hit its target. This is happening day in and day out. We need to get ahead of that. Uh, and the chairman's right. We should be able to do that. We are still the most innovative economy in the world. Uh, best universities, best capital markets, entrepreneurship. We've got it. We just have to figure out how to make sure the government is able to access that in an effective way uh, to give our war fighters what they need uh, to meet our national security needs. Uh, with that, I look forward to the testimony. And again, I thank the chairman uh, for holding this hearing. <clears throat> I thank the ranking member. Now I'd like to introduce our witnesses. Uh, first, we have Mr. Mark Valentine is the president of Global Government uh, Business for Scadio. Mr. Brandon Singh is the co-founder and president of Shield AI. Mr. Shyam Sankar, did I get that right? Shaw. All right. Okay. <laughs> Shyam <laughs> Sankar, I knew I'd mess it up, is the Chief Technology Officer for Palantir. Mr. Peter Ludwig is the co founder and Chief Technology Officer for Applied Intuition. And Mr. Richard Jenkins, co founder of Sail Drone. Uh, I want to welcome our witnesses. Uh, Mr. Valentine, uh, you're up. Thank you, Chairman Rogers, Ranking Member Smith, and members of the committee. Uh, it's a real honor to be here in front of you today. Thank you so much. I am Mark Valentine. I'm the president of our government business at Skydio, where we are the largest. Okay. Mr. Singh, I'd ask the same question. I, I just think Ukraine has been a, a, a great laboratory for us to test things. What, what have you learned uh, in your experience with your products there? 100%, uh, sir. It's been a, a great laboratory. What I think the Ukrainians have discovered is that um, they're not going to use anything that doesn't work on the battlefield, period. And, they, and, and the amount of U.S. equipment that they do not use is staggering because it simply does not work. And that is everything from our most exquisite weapon systems to, our, to cheap drones. Wait, 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 give me an example. You can't just, go, you can't just throw that one out there and leave it. <laughs> we, we've been on the battlefield in, in HIMARS systems, right, our, our, which is an incredible weapon system that I have used 
uh, to great success in Afghanistan. And look, there are variants of the munition that work without GPS, right? These are the laser guided rounds. But when you use a round that does not work or that is principally reliant on GPS, the effects are highly volatile and rare that you will actually hit things. And I what I want you to ask yourself here is, to the credit of the United States in their own manufacturing of weapons, why having GPS systems attached to them to ensure that you actually hit your target and what that means relative to collateral damage or protecting citizens or people who you do not intend to harm and what that might mean relative to his statement that in Ukraine they won't use weapons that do not work. So if they won't use weapons that won't work on the battlefield, what kinds of regulations were met that prevented its use for war fighting purposes? Are you following along? And I think we need to take a, a big look at that as we start to think about great power competition and have a really honest look at what we are buying and fielding and saying, will it work without GPS? Will it work without communications? And I get, I, I get nervous because I have been around, been involved with these U.S. military exercises that tout and there are very few of them that we're going to jam GPS and jam communications. And then they go back on the word. They say, you know what, we're actually not going to do that because too many of our things we know are going to fail. And that is the complete wrong mentality. We need to see those things fail in training, in peacetime, so that we can prepare for war. It seems to me that we're, we're talking about two different really big things here. One is process. How do we move off of our requirements-based stuck process um, that just you know gets you locked into things forever and move towards to the point all of you have made a problem solving flexible adaptive process that can change as as it goes and then the second thing is even within that where do we spend the money and that that's a difficult you know conversation when you're trying to anticipate where things are going but it seems clear to me that we are spending too much money on legacy systems from well in to mr valentine's point in a non-contested world uh, we're, we're imagining fighting the way we've been fighting um in in a world that is not as contested when we're moving into a different world and i would add to one thing you said there it's not just the great powers I mean, the frickin' Houthis are able to come up with something. It, it, the, the barriers to entry here have become so low that we're not going to go walking into Afghanistan, right, anywhere in the world where we don't face an adversary that has the capability of shooting down or sinking some of our largest systems. So we need to, to, to pivot to that. But focusing on the drone manufacturing issue, um, because it seems like it's been a number of years now since it's become clear we need to move in that direction, and yet we are not – manufacturing any significant numbers of the types of drones that are so critical. So very specifically, and this is for any of you, Mr. Valentine, Mr. Saying, you talked about it the most, but what do we need to change to start increasing that production capacity and building the number of drones that we really need? Yeah, thank you, Ranking Member Smith. Uh, I think in short, provide a demand signal. With a codified demand signal and knowing that there is a market there, then I think not only Skydio, but drone manufacturers all across the United States can now start to purchase all the long lead items that need What's to be. What's stopping us from providing that demand signal? Uh, well, Ranking Member Smith, <laughs> there are some signals out there, but you know we hear words and rhetoric, whether they're in the form of replicator, this idea, that idea. but. Quite frankly, well, let me ask you this, and to, kind of to, to point. Mr. Rogers' point, and there are reasons that we don't. We give a lot of demand signals, okay, because they're they're built in for years. Um, but th there is a essential contradiction between industry saying you have to give us a demand signal so we know what to build, and oh by the way, you have to be flexible and adaptive. All right, because if we give you a demand signal and then a year into it, we're like, ah, we learned something new. We don't want that anymore. Now we're locked into a contract forever. Um, it's a problem I have. I was very interested in ending the monopoly that ULA had over, over space launch. Um, okay, well, we gave ULA a really good demand signal, and to a certain extent, they produced, okay? Um, and it was really expensive, and then we got to the point where we needed to adapt and innovate, and we couldn't because we had 10-year contracts. So how do you balance those two things? Mr. Saying, you seem to have a comment so, on that. Um, 
I, you asked the question, what's stopping you? I think the requirements process is what's stopping you. Uh, the DOD, to points made earlier, has all the authorities to go fast. So why can't they? Why aren't they? It's because all of their money is already allocated and budgeted for something that has a requirement, right. which if you have the requirement, then you have fundamentally said, you're not going to innovate anymore. We're just going to fulfill this requirement and execute. Um, if you move to a problem-based system, then that money, you're, you're, you're taking money away from the requirements process and so actually focused on... So what would be on... the first step? Because that's, I'm very interested in that, and you, I think most of you at this table have heard me talk about how I'd like to snap my fingers and eliminate half of the requirements, and I don't care which half. Um, just a good starting point. How, how, do you, how would we do that? How would we go in there and say, okay, there's 5,000 pages of requirements. Those are in the garbage. Solve this problem. I, I think I would first, I would mandate uh, or I would encourage the DOD that 25% of their acquisition dollars in the next three years be spent on a problem-based uh, acquisition system. Um, and from there, what you're going to see is they're going to have to come up with an acquisition system, to a problem-based acquisition system, to actually hit that target that you guys set out for them. And what that's going to do, it's going to shift the flow of money from primarily a requirements-based system, and over time, we can get more to a problem-based system. And are there, are there going to be hiccups? Are there going to be challenges along the way? Yes. Do they hit? 20% or, or 18% maybe, you know, but at least we've started that Which motion of getting them back in the right to the, direction. To the question that I had asked yep. that we moved off of is, how do you balance the need that industry is begging for, for a demand signal, with the flexibility? And Mr. Ludwig, you're shaking your head or nodding your head there, mm -hmm. so why don't you take a stab at it? Um, I think uh, I really want to emphasize that um, the, the importance of, of software and, and then generally agile methodologies to all of these things. Um, uh, I strongly agree with the remarks from uh, Mr. Sang about, uh, about a, a problem-based system being highly advantageous because uh, in our own work with the Department of Defense, many times we feel uh, somewhat uh, restricted in terms of what we can propose because of the requirements uh, given, given to us. Whereas if the, uh, the requirements are, are more so in, in, the, the, in, in a problem statement, uh, we can actually uh, provide a much more comprehensive solution using more creative adaptations of our technologies. Yeah, makes sense. D doesn't answer my question, though. Um, Ludwig gave an ethical answer, was shamed for it, and from this point forward, you can almost see his sense of failure in this competitive process. Makes sense. D doesn't answer my question, though. Um, Mr. Sankar? If I can offer, so there, there, I don't think you need 10-year contracts. That when people say demand signal, I think what, what it comes down to is what is the marginal time and effort it will take to, ch to make a new fiscal purchase. Right. So what's the fiscal OODA loop? Yeah. And you know, private capital will show up if I know, like, look, you can make a buying decision every two months. Right. I, I think even one year is too late and too slow. Yeah. So if we can get many more bites of the apple, this is the, this is the fiscal version of DevSecOps. Right. So to some extent, it's less a matter of a demand signal and more a matter of a signal that we will change and we will, you produce something we want, we're going to buy it. Okay. And that's important because I tell you that the, the bigger primes, they like their demand signals too. And what they mean by demand signal is promise us that no matter what, for the next 10 years, you're going to keep giving us money. Okay, and we've been locked into that in a very crippling way. So I appreciate that distinction. Last question, um, where is DOD spending money right now that we shouldn't be spending money? Because that's the second part of this. It's a finite amount of money. Okay, you want us to spend all this money on drones? We got, we got the budget we got. We got a $34 trillion um, debt or deficit, um, either debt actually. Um, what shouldn't we be spending money on that we're spending it on right now? Mr. Jenkins? <clears throat> So I thoroughly agree with the requirements argument. Like one of my favorite uh, sayings is a camel is a horse designed by committee. I think LCS is good, well described by that. Um, so yeah, precise requirements or lack of requirements and project-based um, solutions is, is key. Um, you then have a lot of people making new innovative systems, but do they actually work at scale that we need? Right? So the concept of a bridge fund approach was to give more money for testing prior to end of life in something. So the POM process, zero net sum game, you know something's going to have to go to get something new in. Those officers, those individuals don't have the confidence in the new technology to end up something that's not proven. So run alongside, is this next piece. To your question of what can you cut, I think I look at it as how is the, dish, the spend spread across the DOD. From my perspective, which is at the lower end of the, the innovation loop, um, I see a lot spent on R&D innovation. Uh, I think the DOD spends $50 billion on innovation and zero on go-to-market. 
As an example, the Navy spends less than $40 million on fleet integration, integration projects a year. That's 0.01% of the R&D budget. If you're a commercial company, a civilian company, you have a product, you spend some money on, on R&D, you make a product, then go, go to market strategy, customer testing, um, innovation testing, uh, supply chain, manufacturing, advertising, marketing, sales. What we do is, as a DOD, as a country, is you spend all the money on R&D and nothing on the go-to-market strategy. If you're Apple, invented a new product, but spent nothing on how to make it, how to ship it, how to sell it, how to market it, and just sat in your hands waiting for orders to come in, you'd have no sales. I think that's I mean, a really good point that I had not heard or thought of that way so before. I think yeah. you need to equalize the money between the R&D stage and then the tech, how to sell it, how to market it, and just sat in your hands waiting for orders to come in, you'd have no sales. I think that's I mean, a really good point that I had not heard or thought of that way so before. I think yeah. you need to equalize the money between the R&D stage and then the testing and implementation phase before the full-scale operations. And right now, we're just missing that Got testing it. implementation, which is the point of the bridge fund concept. I'm about out of time here, but Mr. Singh, I'll give you the last word on that question of where we, where yes, we sir. can potentially I, save money. If, if the countermeasure to a system is very cheap, uh, the example being if a $1 million missile can blow up a $400 million ship, or if a $1 million surface-to-air missile can take down a $100 million fighter jet, then we probably want to be buying less of those. Um, and I'm not saying you're getting rid of every single one of them, right, but I'm talking about what the Air Force would call a high-low mix, where we have a few exquisite systems that are augmented by thousands, uh, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, eventually millions of cheaper unmanned systems. And so you, you just want to move that cost asymmetry advantage to the United States versus where it lies right now, with his, which is with so just, China. Just to now I want to talk about how this trickles down to an individual household and an individual family. Um, after I watched the video, as I was sort of ranting to myself about what I had just watched, um, I realized that, um, Chili had eliminated inside. Well, actually I knew that she had because Amaya told me, but I thought Amaya had cleaned it up and she was just letting me know that it had happened, but she didn't. She just wanted me to know that it had happened. And so when I got up and, and saw that it was there, I was like, oh, you know, I have to, you know, now I have to deal with this which is an, has been an ongoing issue for us um, since she had her first heat cycle. Now, you have to keep in mind that Chile was a stray capture rescue that we adopted. And, uh, and we're, we've been very patient with her, and, we, and I love her very much. But I bring this up because I did not want to get a dog. And Jermaine had indicated, you know, a, a year or more ago that he was interested in getting a dog. And I said, I'm not, we're not getting a dog. And the reason I didn't want to get a dog is because I knew that given my trauma and everything else that I deal with on a regular basis, that I was not going to be able to give a companion animal the kind of attention that they need, one, to just get them trained and acclimated to living inside of a, a house, which is a big part of bringing animals who, you know, would be in the wild into a domestic situation. Um, but then just the ongoing care, I just, you know, I, I'm, you know, I struggle most days to take care of myself. And so I really did not want the additional responsibility of taking care of, of a dog, especially because he's at work most of the time. And as I thought about that, while I was cleaning, cleaning this up, you know, I thought about young people and, you know, how they make decisions about starting their own families. Um, a lot of times without having a serious marital um, investment in one another. And, and I'm careful and I say that word because there are couples who, you know, they don't have a ring or, or, or you know, all that, but they are very committed to each other and they do, you know, it is their eternal partner and they want to be together. It's just these labels and the society, you know, uh, symbols and indicators that they feel like they have to have the big wedding and, you know, all of that kind of stuff, which has nothing to do with living the rest of your life. Those are very singular events. Anyway, um, and, you know, what family planning should be, because, you know, I, I did a video and I shared with everyone the journal entry that I did back in 2001, when I felt like we were ready to grow our family. We already had Deja 
And um, and I really wanted her to be close in age to um, so that we could grow up close. There was enough time that Deja had some some level of independence, and I felt like it would be um, better for me to wait until she had that, so that I wouldn't have that additional burden of of small ch- of two small children at the same time while I was working. But of course, I had twins, so you can't you know you can't predict some of this stuff, y'all. Um. Anyway. Um. But I wrote out a whole plan to present to Jermaine um, for us to make the decision about whether or not it was time because we needed to factor in a lot of things other than just laying down and getting pregnant. We had to factor in, you know, my energy level, my availability, what our long-term goals were for our, our kids and for our family, how much it would cost us if I were to stay home, um, you know, what additional burden that would create for him and how that would impact me, his availability to be here with us as a family versus being forced to travel because the money might be better that way and how we could negotiate all of that, you know, for the amount of time we felt it would be necessary that we really need, we're really able to hunker down and not have a lot of movement, you know, that it's temporary as the kids grow, get older and they become more independent, then as parents, we gain more independence, or we reclaim more independence um, because they don't require as much supervision for this, that, or the other thing. And then, you know, it just cry- if you're doing a good job as they grow and they mature, you know, they require less and less supervision. And so you reclaim more and more of your freedom and your relationships start to shift because, you know, then they start driving and so they can drive themselves or you they can take you out on dates, you know, together and things like that. Um, so, you know, I think about these five men, five men on this panel as witnesses who are really salespeople for the companies that they work for, they own, and whether or not, you know, they take everything into consideration relative to what it is they do and what they sell and how that sort of back, uh, the backlash of that for them in their own individual homes, because with Chile, for example, you know, we've made a commitment to her. We've adopted her. She's she's part of our family. She's going to be here. But this is exactly the kind of thing that I wanted to avoid. We have, you know, a Bissell that we we recently purchased to be able to clean the floor. But it's hard for me. It's not a stand. It's not an upright. And so, you know, usually Jermaine has to do the Bissling because I would have to get down on my knees and my back bothers me. And, you know, you think about, you know, people... uh decided that they want to have a companion animal or even at another level that they're willing to start their family. And so then Jermaine has to make a decision, you know, I, it's my responsibility to take care of her so that she can take care of me. So if, you know, if we're going to, if she's going to be here to take care of the kids and take care of me, then we need to make sure that the the tasks and the responsibilities that she has at home do not exceed her current capacity because then it's going to fall back on me. One of us is going to have to do it. So, you know, when in the case with Chili, when he when he if I don't whistle it, then when he gets home from work, having been at work all day, he's going to have to do it because it has to be done. So, you know, he has to take into consideration, you know, what the burden is on me of anything that we add into our home that I'm going to be responsible for so that he can do what he needs to do to take care of me so that I can take care of him and that we are able to take care of the whole household together. So, you know, you you have to be able to think that way if you're going to be successful in your relationships and in your parenting, whether it be, you know, you you are starting with a pet, which is a, actually a good idea for a lot of people to be, because it's a lot of responsibility to properly care for a companion animal and to begin to develop a relationship with them so that you have a language. Um, or have children, start to have your family or grow your family, whether or not, you are able to have everything that you need in terms of resources and then in terms of your physical capacity to be able to take care of all of those needs. So you think about these five people sitting here, you know, witnessing for um, the Armed Services Committee and what they are suggesting are things that will completely disrupt my capacity 
or my husband's capacity or any person or family or community's capacity to be able to live and function in their own homes. And then you go and then you leave this meeting feeling successful because it's, you know, it's like a competition and, you know, and then things are not the way you want them to be at home because somebody before you who might've been an undergraduate student, according to the, the ranking member, um, gave the department a defense an idea, which they decided to turn around and, and acquire, um, um, the mechanics for, or the, the parts for to have built so that they could set up all this infrastructure that's around my house that prevents me from being able to bend down on the floor to be able to bristle and bristle a, a, a mistake, an accident that our pet has made. And so it just sits there. So then my husband comes home and he has to do it. And now he's upset because he's been working all day. And he's like, well, what have you been doing? Well, I've been trying to recover from not getting any sleep and being in pain all day and, you know, all that kind of stuff. I mean, I hope that I'm making sense to people and that, you know, it you don't, it, it's not like I'm rambling because I want people to understand the implications and the impact of the de individual decisions each person's each person makes on other people, which then ultimately will come back and impact you. I mean, if you go back and look and, and watch this 10 minutes of video that I've shared with that in mind, can you look at those men on that panel the same way? Who do they go home to? What do they go home? What is it like at home for them? What do they think these weapons are for? You know, they talk, the last guy in the video talks about how much he believes that the way that they can save money is to re, is to shift some of the fiscal burden from research and development into testing. Testing where? On who? How? Do you understand what I'm saying to you? The earth is dying and it will continue to die until people change their mind or becomes completely uninhabitable. People, you know, they add animals to the endangered list, you know, all the time. Humans are endangered. Families, biological families with a mother and a father are endangered. And you know that's the truth. You hear me saying that and you know it's the truth. Why? Because it's not the animals. It's not the animals that are, are creating an endangered status for biological families. There's a difference between being mortal, meaning that you've decided that earth is all there is, you, you, you're born and then you die here and then that's it. And that is the truth. But there are also immortals. How long do you believe human beings have existed in this world? Because I can promise you, human beings have existed longer than 2,024 years. So 2,024 years as a measure of time must have some significance for some people. Just think about that. 